Hey, I'm not a Mac person, so this is very strange for me. Uh, yeah, here we go. Okay, uh, JavaScript databases two, and I called it two, as Anna said, uh, because this happened last year at LXJS. And I, I think it's a shame that Max is not here this year to put this, his slide set up with that background because this screen would be awesome for that presentation. Uh, and I'm just not cool enough to have something so cool as that. Um, so Max talked about JavaScript databases and basically outlined his dream for what we could do. And this is one of the things he said. He said, I want to see a time where I can write a persistence function that can run in Node, the browser, and anywhere else that JavaScript runs. We've had a few projects that existed before then. We've got uh, PouchDB, um, no, um, yeah, and uh, a couple of other things that were um, you know, floating around. But since Max's talk, uh, we've had a lot happen, as Anna said. Um, and a lot of it has been centered around LevelDB, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard about it. And we've even had at least one talk today that's referenced it um, in Node. In Max's talk last year, he, uh, he, he gave away a fish to Dominic um, for a question. And he asked, um, the first question he asked was, what, does anyone know what the storage structure is that LevelDB uses? And nobody can answer it. And so the backup question was, what's the current production version of Node? I think this year, though, we probably have a lot of people that actually know the storage, the name of the storage system that LevelDB uses. Can I have anyone? I don't have a fish, but anyone want to have a go? Anyone at all? Dominic Tarr. <laughs> What's it called, Dominic? Uh, a log yeah, okay, so it's a lock structured merge tree. Um, now, LevelDB is an open source embedded key value store written by Google. And it was originally designed for Chromium uh, to implement their index DB system. So it's a storage system that they use across um, all of their implementations of Chromium. It's also used for just general storage in Chromium as well. Um, and now it's, it's got wide adoption uh, across the community for things all the way up to React uses it. They, they actually use it as their recommended storage system for large data sets. Um, all the way down to small devices use it. So it's a really pervasive library. Its basic operations are get, put, and delete. It has an atomic batch. Its entries are sorted by keys, which is extremely important. And it has these bi-directional iter iterators. So you can go from any point in the database forward and backward to search for things. And because it's sorted, this is actually quite useful. So LevelDB has served as the foundation for the work that we've been doing in uh, JavaScript databases so far. Um, and it's inspired a lot of the, um, the, the, the structure that we've come up with. So I'll just dig into a little bit further about what the level DB is. So a log structured merge tree. Uh, this is that thing that Max was talking about. A log structured merge tree is, it's, this is not a B tree or all these other structures, it's very different. When you write into level DB, the writes go straight into a log. And the log is also called a mem table because it's stored in memory and it's stored in a log file uh, on the system. So writes immediately go into there. Over time, the log fills up and they get the, the entries in the log get flushed into these string sorted table files. So mm -hmm. the, the table files are sorted uh, and there's this process of compaction that takes logs, the log, log data and puts it into these SST files. The SST files, they're fixed in size, but they grow into a hierarchy of overlapping levels, which is where the level comes from, from level DB. So level DB can hold a, a lot of data. It can hold terabytes of data. Um, and the way it can do that and, ma and maintain its sorting is this hierarchical structure where the lower levels only contain a small amount of data, and each larger level contains um, 10 times the size of the previous level. So, um, I, I won't go into details, but basically it's a really efficient way of keeping sorted data even when you get massive amounts of it. When you read from LevelDB, the reads merge the log data and the SST file data. So if it's in the log, it comes out straight away. Um, and that could include a delete. So the delete might be in the log as well. So uh, it'll come back out and say, not found. Um, if it's not in the log, it'll go searching through these levels, um, looking for the entry and return it whenever it finds it, or 
If it gets to the end, it says it's not there. And there's a cache on top of it to speed up common reads, and that, that can be as large as you want. Um, you could fit it into your whole memory if you want to have lots of um, fast lookups. So, as I said, this has inspired what we've done in uh, the JavaScript databases world, and it's inspired these primitives that we have, um, that we've sort of whittled down to what are the absolute essential things that we need to build complex database systems in, uh, in JavaScript. Um, and these, this is the list that we've ended up with. Open and close, I think, is pretty uh, reasonable. Um, a get, put, and delete. Um, arguably, you don't need a delete, but we've got it there for ex uh, explicitness. Um, an atomic batch, a read stream, um, and this is all for arbitrary data. So this is for binary data as well as text or JavaScript objects or whatever. So get, put, and delete are fairly basic. I think we all understand how that works in a key value store. Um, the atomic batch and the read stream are probably the interesting ones, so I'll, I might um, delve into them a little bit. So read stream, and why is this important? And this, is, this comes from the fact that it's sorted data. We can use a read stream as a really basic query mechanism. This is the foundation of a query mechanism that you can build really complex querying um, structures on top of. So let's say you have a, a set of data here that's, um, you can see it's sorted there, just some key, alphabetical keys. It's not important what they are, but um, let's say you want to get all of the values from E to H. Um, so what you can do is we'll create, create a read stream, say start at E, end at H, and that stream will, will emit entries for each of the, um, the keys that it finds in that range. So this is a really basic way of saying, give me these, this little range. But we can go further, because what happens if you don't know what's there? What happens if you, because you know, there's huge data sets, and you don't know what every key is, and, you, and it's, you can't guess. So you need some way of finding data. So let's say you wanted all of the entries that started with the letter F. Um, and you don't know that there's F1 and F2 there. You just say, I want the Fs. So what you can do is this little thing. You create a read stream that starts at character F, and it ends at F tilde. Now, the reason this, this would work is because the, um, the read stream will start at any point in the database, even if that key doesn't exist. It'll just jump to the next key. So we can say start at F. There's nothing there. It jumps up to the next key. The end, the reason we're using the little tilde character there is because this is um, ASCII character 126, I think. So it comes after all, after all of the standard printable ASCII characters. So what we're actually saying there is we want everything that starts with F and has a second character that is before that character. So it actually doesn't matter how long the key is. It could, it could be really long words. As long as the second character doesn't go beyond that tilde character, we would get everything within that range. In practice, we probably would actually use ASCII character 255, so at the very end of the ASCII range. Um, but for printability, this is a, a good way of, of demonstrating it. So why is batch important? Um, let's start with an example of, of building an index. Say you have a database where you're just putting these objects. So this is just putting some JavaScript objects there. Um, the key is foo and, and boom, and the, the, the objects that we're putting in, these are serialized with JSON and then deserialized on the way out. But they, they each have a, a name property and an X property. Let's say we want to index these ob um, objects on the name property so that we can fetch them later on that property. So you can see an example query we might have there. We want to make some sort of method that does get me um, anything that has the name property of bar. Uh, we don't have the keys to them. We don't know it's foo, but we know what, what we want from the name property. So how are we going to build an index that does this? Well, this is one approach. What we do is we, we create this second entry for each entry that we put in that actually points to uh, the original entry that has the index information in it we, that we want. So we actually use the key to look up um, the, the value. So what I've, I've, what I've done there, I've structured the key so that um, the word index is first. I've just said index because this is an index. It doesn't really matter. The next um, part of it 
is name, because I'm indexing the name property. The part after that is the, the value that I've indexed. And then the part after that is actually the key. And the reason I put the key there is because you need unique keys and you could have multiple objects with the same name property. So that's just for uniqueness. It could also help with sorting. The value that I'm putting in is a reference back to the original entry. I hope that's not too confusing, but basically we're putting a second entry in so that we can look, 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 look things up by name. Um, so every time we write, we put this extra accounting entry in. And then we have some code that looks something like this. This is pretty rough, but basically we've got a get by function. We can get by any index. Uh, the value that we want to get, and then it has a callback. This will just return the keys. In practice, you might want to return a stream or all the, all the values themselves. So we're going to use this uh, read stream again, and we're going to start at um, index, the index name, the value we're looking up, and then we're going to end with the tilde character there again, and that's so that we capture the exact name that we want to look up. And we're going to end at everything um, that you know, that starts with that. So basically everything that has that name in it. Um, the mechanics of that are not that important, but basically it, we're going to target exactly those, those values and we'll only get back those values. We don't have to go searching. This will return exactly the ones we want. For each entry, we'll put it into an array and then we'll return that array on a callback. So that's what an index function might look like. Um, but there's a problem with this index function, which is consistency. So what happens if your, does, if your process crashes halfway between here? If you write in your first entry, but for some reason your second entry doesn't go in. Um, you end up with a data store that's inconsistent. You have entries in there that are not, in, not indexed at all, um, and you may have other objects with that same name. So if you look, them up, look up that name, then you wouldn't get the complete list. So this is where um, an atomic batch comes in. With a batch, what we can do is say, all of these things must happen together, or they don't happen at all. So we're going to use this uh, make a new put function that uh, uses a uh, batch, puts the original entry, it puts our index value as well, and then writes it to the database. And that happens in one go, and it either all succeeds or it all fails. So for every entry we're writing, we're writing this additional accounting entry. Um, and then so, if we've got a put here, then you can see that um, it would create a second uh, entry for that one put in one go. So that's why batch is important. And this process is um, handled automatically by a package that's called level hooks in, uh, in NPM. Um, another example of, of why we might want to use a batch uh, is um, let's say we want to perform some asynchronous work for each entry that goes into the database. Um, we we want to. We want to know that the, bit, that the work is done for every time we write something. So we put an entry in, say we have to go off to a website and submit something for every entry, or we have to you know, signal something. And that's an asynchronous operation. And we want to ensure that it is done every time. What we can do in this case is we can actually write a marker entry in with every write. So we can, put a, uh, we can write an entry, and then we can write a second entry that marks saying this job is pending. And then when we do the work, we can delete the pending, so we know that the work is done, um, and we don't have to do it again. And the reason that this is helpful is because if, it, if your process crashes while you're, um, the job is, is being done, um, and it doesn't get done, you've got these pending markers in there. And you can run this little read stream down the bottom here that fetches all of the pendings and can rerun them again. So without an atomic batch, you can't ensure these kinds of operations. You can, you can sort of vaguely target them, but you can't ensure that they, these things happen. So that's why a batch um, is an important primitive for building databases. Something else that's not really a primitive, but um, ends up being quite essential for what, what we need to do is this concept of buckets or namespaces. Um, and this is basically a way of organizing a, a one-dimensional array of data into separate tables. So for example, here I've got a bunch of entries that are being put. Um, and you can see there's two types of entries. There's countries and there's cities. So they're two very different types of data, and they could uh, be quite, you know, here they're just objects with one property, but they could be quite complex, quite different. So by separating them like this and putting these little markers at the front of the keys, we're creating these separate namespaces. This is such a common pattern that we actually have a library already that uh, does this um, with, um, with level. It's called sublevel, and what it does 
is it takes your data store um, and lets you create sub data stores on top of that for these different bu buckets. And you have the same API, with the same, you can do the same put operations, and you can even create read streams on them, um, and they operate within these discrete buckets of data. So it's as if you have separate, completely separate databases, but you're actually operating on the same data store. So this is a, a, um, an important way of um, managing separate kinds of data, but also managing this account-keeping data, like the pending flag or the index flag, um, where you want to keep them separate from your main data, so you put them in these separate um, sub-levels, we call them. So we start off with level DB, um, but we've actually, within the, the past year, we've gone a lot further than that. Using these primitives, we've discovered that you can apply them to many other types of data stores. Um, for a start, there's other level DB forks. There's the one that Basho maintains for React. Um, it's got some different performance characteristics. That's available now in, uh, in Node. You can install the Basho fork if you want to use it in place of the normal Google level DB. And there's one called HyperLevel DB that's used for the Hyperdex database. That's available too. That has some really interesting performance characteristics, especially for Node, because it's really good with multi-threaded access, which is, um, which is great for us. Um, there's another one called LMDB, which is, uh, uses a B-tree storage, and it uses memory mapping to get it done. So in theory, it should be very quick. Um, but that's an, an interesting project. But it has all these primitives that we can use. So you can switch out the storage backend um, in, in Node um, for your database system, depending on the, da the data you have and your preferences. There's one called memdown, which is pure in memory. It's just Jav JavaScript objects, keeping them in memory, and um, they're not persisted to disk. But you have exactly the same API where you get to interact with these objects um, in your memory. There's a fun little project called MySQL down, which implements the whole API on top of a MySQL database. So you get the same API, but you're actually interacting with SQL. And there's a few more under development um, as well that are going on now. The, the interesting one is Level.js by Max Ogden. And he implements this API uh, in the browser um, on top of IndexedDB, which is a little bit ironic because we're going from LevelDB, which runs IndexedDB, and then we're rewrapping it in something that then gives us the API that's very similar to the original LevelDB. So Level.js lets you run LevelUp this, um, this package in the browser and use IndexedDB as your storage system. So you get to use all of these little add-ons that we have in this ecosystem in your browser exactly the same way as on the server. So you can have mirrored systems that look, look and behave exactly the same, one's in the browser and one's on the server. So this is a, um, this is a, a, a table that sort of tries to represent what we've got going on in the ecosystem right now uh, in the Java, da Java databases, JavaScript databases world. Uh, it's not complete, it's, it's just meant to be representative. So what we have at the core, at the red section, is level up. It's the core library with those primitives in it. It's very simple, um, but it, it, it presents this very um, tight API for the basic operations that you need. Underneath it, in the yellow, we've got all these different storage backends that you can switch in and out. Um, you, can, you can opt for the storage system that suits your use, whether you're in the browser, whether you're on the server, whether you have particular performance needs. Um, you just choose the back end that you want. On top of that, we've got this section called extensibility. Um, I've called it that because these packages help you build additional extensions. That's their main use. So things like sublevel and level hooks, um, level mutex, even there's one called multi-level just above it that sort of could be there as well. These are things that you would use as building blocks to get further up the chain. And then we have these extensions, which really do extend the functionality of, of level up to give you useful features. Uh, things like level live stream, which gives you a live stream of data. As, as it gets written to the data store, you can actually stream it straight back out again. Um, map reduce, you know, obviously it doesn't map reduce um, on top of level up. Um, Level multiply gives you multi-get, multi-put, these sort of things that you expect from some other database systems. Level TTL gets you, gives you a TTL option on every write, so you can write to your data store and it'll, and it'll automatically delete them for you. So these little, little pieces of functionality end up being extensions in this Node, uh, JavaScript database world um, that you can choose to build your custom uh, persistent system. Uh, on top of that, there's a section called packages, which uh, 
these are things that don't necessarily extend level up for you to use, but they actually use level up to create a full system. And some of these things are actually full database systems. So TacoDB, Couch, CouchUp, and Level Graph uh, are basically full database systems. Level Graph is a, is a graph database that's built on top of this. Um, and it's actually got its own ecosystem of plugins developing around it as well. Um, some of the other things are just ut good utilities. FireUp is a Firebase clone that's being developed. Um, and a few other interesting things there. And at the top there is tools. These are tools for interacting with the data store. We've got Lev, which is a command line tool for interacting with the full data store. If you want to query, you want to enter values, retrieve values, whatever. And Level Web is a full web interface to the store as well. So these are great little utilities. So this is an ecosystem that's in hot development now. Um, there's a lot going on there that I can't show there. Um, and there's a lot of people doing this as well. This is, this is not just a few of us. There's a lot of people, in our, and it's so big that I can't keep track of what's going on. I can't keep track of who's doing what. It's just, it's gone you know, wild since it's happened. Um, this is the Level Up core team, and it's quite large. And this is just for that simple Level Up library. They also help maintain the, um, some of the core backends as well. But the reason it's large is that Level Up is, a, is an open project. Um, when people come along and they have a significant contribution, and that contribution is accepted, then they get, they get um, to be part of the team, and they get to share in the decision-making process. So this excellent group of programmers helps us keep the API tight. Um, we can discuss things at length and, um, and present a really um, excellent API for people to build databases on. So that's the end of my talk. My aim is um, to encourage you all that um, the database world is not something that you have to um, you know, go out and get a product off the shelf for. It's actually something that you can play with now. You can um, start using these little packages to implement things that you might use in production, um, or you could use them to build your own tools um, just for experimentation. There's a lot of interesting theory and practice out there in the database world, um, and you have the ability now to start um, going on a path of education and learning these things, writing these things for yourself. Um, so, Awesome possibilities there, um, and I really hope to see some of you um, pushing out some really cool code in the JavaScript database as well. So that's me. Thank you very much.